Welcome to Designing a Better World, a brand new Ismaili Center Toronto series focused on designers who are improving our society through creativity, imagination, and passion. Today, the relevance of design is expanding far beyond the visual aesthetics to everything from tackling global issues such as climate change to making sense of the overwhelming amounts of data that surrounds us. Designers have the unique ability to make information, products, and experiences both simpler and richer all at once. From architecture to policy making, entertainment to organizational design, this series brings together leading thinkers who are building a more inclusive, resilient, and peaceful world through better design. And it's hosted right here at the beautiful Ismaili Center Toronto, right across from the Aga Khan Museum. Both of these stunning buildings in the Aga Khan Park, a little slice of paradise in the heart of our vibrant city of Toronto and open for all to enjoy. The city's diverse culture and religious communities come together at the Ismaili Center to share, learn and celebrate, to create a more peaceful, sustainable and robust society. This in turn aspires connection between people and inspires change that the future will be better than the present. I am so excited to kicking off the Designing a Better World series. Take it away, Rahim. Thank you, President Sai. My name is Rahim Bimani, and I'm a trained industrial designer, product designer with an MBA in design strategy. Now I'm a designer who's absolutely obsessed with anything that has to do with design, creativity, and architecture. Now I have my own design studio called Arabesque Studios that focuses on designing high-end products inspired by Islamic geometry. I'm honored to be your first ever host of this new series called Designing a Better World. Let us begin by acknowledging the rich and enduring history of the Indigenous peoples in Ontario. We acknowledge that this land is the traditional territory of the Wendat, the Anishinaabeg, the Haudenosaunee, Matisse, and the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nations. The treaty that was signed for this particular parcel of land is collectively referred to as the Toronto Purchase and applies to land east of Brown's Line to Woodbine Avenue and north towards Newmarket. This territory is also covered by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to peaceably share and care for the land and its resources. So why a series on design? Well, we may not realize this, but design affects our lives every day. For example, we start our day with our ergonomic toothbrush, to the clothes we put on, especially to the app experiences that we all use on our cell phones all the time. Now, what our goal with this series is to talk to bright minds in various different facets of design to understand how they use their talents to design a better world for all of us. Today we're in conversation with Adam Williamson. He's an award-winning calligrapher, geometry artist, sculptor, and a good personal friend of mine. Adam is based in the UK and has worked on some amazing prestigious projects all around the world. He's been commissioned internationally by His Royal Highness the Prince of Wales, taught at NYU, Spotify, the Shakespeare Globe, and partnered with the British Museum, to name a few. Adam has taught and has led thousands of students through in-person workshops around the world in places like Morocco, Spain, Dubai, Iran, and most recently has been teaching online during the pandemic. Now let's talk to Adam. Hey Adam, how's it going? How's London? It's lovely and rainy, as it's to be expected. <laughs> well, I'm glad you're indoors, Adam. Thank you so much for taking the time with me to sit down and talk to me about this complex world of Islamic geometry. You know, Adam, I've been following you for ages and I was really fortunate enough to actually attend one of your workshops in New York last year to inspire one of my projects. Now, Islamic geometry, as I mentioned, is pretty complex. Can you explain to me the different styles that kind of live under this larger umbrella of Islamic geometry? 
Yeah, of course. So um, within Islamic art, it can be uh, first sort of seen in, as, a, as a canon with three distinct aspects. You have the geometric, which is probably most famous for worldwide. Um, and that's the compass and ruler um, star patterns that you'll see in rosettes and mandalas um, around the Islamic world. And then you have the arabesque. Arabesque just means Arab style. Um, so we use the term biomorphic um, because this is the sort of floral vegetative aspect that's um, practiced from the Malacca Straits to, you know, in Malaysia to the, the Berber um, tribesmen of Morocco. So um, we use the umbrella term biomorphs for the more flowery um, aspects, cursive, curvilinear forms. And then at the top of that hierarchy is the calligraphic because this is a divine words that are venerated and these patterns are flowing and moving towards that calligraphic form. That's absolutely beautiful. Now that you've explained these different styles and how they interplay with one another, it seems very apparent. Now I'm just reflecting back on the various places I visited and how these different styles all merge together, whether it's in a project or a mosque or, or a building. Now, the reason why I feel so passionate about this art form is because I am very passionate about design and my faith, and I just love this convergence that I get from when I practice this art and how fulfilling it is for me. Now, how about for you? Now, other than a pencil, what kind of drew you into Islamic geometry? <laughs> okay, so um, both my parents were interested in Sufism, so I sort of had that aura of um, uh, uh, mystical um, Sufi poets and um, trips to Turkey and um, interesting uh, sort of exposure to that world as I was growing up. But it wasn't until I was studying illumination, European illumination, that I was introduced to the Mamluk uh, Qurans that are famously um, found in, in the British Library. Um, and the creator at the time, Martin Lynx, at the British Library, uh, became um, a sort of a bit of a supporter and a patron and um, and it was through him and that I got exposed to um, the Sultan Ujaitu manuscript and some of these famous um, uh, frontispieces and that's what really got my interest. I already had some of the technical gilding um, skills down but then that was my kind of in and from then I was just like sucked into a wormhole and I've been obsessed ever since. I agree. It's a very addictive art and I could test to that. Clearly, Islamic geometry is a big part of your life. How do you feel it's shaped you as the person you are today? Yeah, well, I've always been interested in crafts. So my father's a craftsman and I wanted a, I wanted a set of skills as a springboard to, um, you know, express my creativity through. Uh, so I spent my life kind of trying to outrun modernity and technology. So I started as a sign writer and then um, after a year of painting cafes and bookstores, I found the vinyl plastic sign putting me out of business. So I went into calligraphy and from there I got into stone carving and I was sort of um, attaining these skills, uh, adding strings to my bow. Um, and uh, sort of this all kind of came together under the tutelage um, of Keith Critchlow, uh, who through geometry, combined, you know, the sort of spiritual, the practical, uh, the metaphysical, um, the, the physical, everything in, under this umbrella of, of geometry, you know, whereas before there were kind of disparate interests of mine. Um, so it's a really exciting time when I was in my early 20s. The search for this knowledge has taken me all around the world. And then subsequently, the skills that I've adopted and then um, used for commissioned work and, uh, and for my own sculpture shows have then taken me on around the world again as a sort of more as a teacher. So to answer your question more precisely, the effect on my life is um, fantastic because I've been able to travel the world. So I teach, you know, now I'm at the stage where I'm teaching and I'm invited to, you know, uh, Australia, New York, um, South America, but I'm um, taking people on study trips to Iran, to Morocco, Turkey. Um, so I get to travel, I get to meet all these incredible craftsmen and learn from them. And I, the learning never ends. I'm still, uh, whenever I go to a place, I'm seeking out um, these, these malams and trying to um, absorb as much as I can. Might be just having like a mint tea with them and get a few tea and, uh, and, and a bit of a vibe from them about 
about their their kind of process and how and their lifestyle. Um, you mentioned the idea of learning in different ways. I've been fortunate enough to attend one of your workshops in New York last year, and I was really hoping to attend one of your international studies trips this year, but obviously due to COVID, that's made it very difficult. Now, have you managed to adapt to this online Zoom world and still be true to the ethic of learning that's so dear to you? Yeah, so I've always been reluctant to go online, even though being asked. So I'd rather travel and be with people, and I'm so interested in the hands-on approach. I want to carve. I want to kind of have that um, intimacy with the audience to the students. Um, but when the pandemic hit, we're all stuck indoors, right? So um, what could I offer? You know, just sort of sharing these patterns. And I just didn't realize that it would be, it would explode to, to, to that level. So there were just free classes. It meant that people could tune in from all over. And um, there was a subsequent community that grew out of that. Uh, people were really taking it um, to another level, creating beautiful artwork in between the sessions. Um, and uh, it's just gone from strength to strength. So I've been really happy to, to offer a service in these crazy times and, um, and just meet a whole new um, area of people and just share what I've been fortunate to be exposed to. It's amazing to hear that you're able to pivot what you were doing and really make an impact on others during these rough times to make others happy through art. Yeah, but it made me happy too. <laughs> With all this traveling you did before, was there anywhere that really stood out to you? Well, one of the nice things about the study trips that we've been running is that um, we build all these interesting partnerships with people and the way that they um, manifest is always quite synchronicitous. So, you know, for example, in Istanbul, when we were working there, we were looking for uh, a venue and partners out there and we spent a whole week going to different places and then we were in the Sukuna Mehmet Pasha which is a famous Sinan mosque and uh, just wondering about this design center which a few people have said talked to us about You're like oh the Istanbul design center oh yes oh yes and then and then we were thinking oh maybe we should go and go and find this place and then we looked up and we were just standing right outside it in the whole big city where you know we were right there so we just literally stepped forward, knocked on the door, and uh, Husrev, the director, came out, and um, we had chai. And by the end of it, you know, we 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 started a relationship that lasted ten years. And that that sort of thing happened in um, in Morocco too, with the incredible houses that we work in, Riyadh and Dars. You know, we have these um, long term relationships with people there and the craftsmen too, um, that the kind of participants, people who join us, really feel and. But each little trip we do is like a mini adventure. You know, if we go to Morocco, we often all live together. So, they, you know, have 20, 30 people coming from America, Australia, you know, all around the, all the world. And we'll, we'll, we'll live in this ancient Medina for a week, being pattern, working with local craftsmen. And it's really like a sort of uh, retreat almost, you know, as well as the kind of academic research that we do. People make these lifelong connections and have like spiritual epiphanies and, um, so it's been a real pleasure to be a uh, witness to, to, that, to that development and that, um, um, to those kind of occasions, yeah. Well, I really hope we can get you to come to Toronto soon when the pandemic is over and learn from you. Speaking of Toronto, I'm in this beautiful Ismaili Centre and what's really interesting about this building is there's this eight-pointed star motif that's scattered all across the building. It's on the carpet, it's on the tiles, it's on the walls, it's literally everywhere. Could you speak about the significance of this octagon and eight-pointed star in Islamic geometry? Yeah, so uh, all of these polygons um, and underlining grids have, um, you know, uh, sacred either like numerical values or like proportions. Um, if we were looking, for example, at the eight-pointed star, um, which is often known as, known as the Seal of Solomon or the Khatam, um, this relates to uh, the... Um, the cardinal directions, um, which is really the uh, fundamentals within geometry. Geometry just means earth measure. Uh, and it was often used as the right of orientation. So you take a staff and you take a, a shadow from that staff from the sun, and then you'd use a string and, disc and scribe on the ground um, the cardinal directions using this uh, eight-pointed star. Uh, it's also related to the elements. So you'd have the, the four points of the uh, dynamic square would be fire, earth, water, and air. And then in between on the other points of the eight-pointed star, you'd have 
um, you know, the, uh, the alchemical elements, dry, cold, moisture, heat, you know, expansion, contraction, alchemy. Um, and then you could have the, the it also relates to the, um, the seasons. And what's beautiful about this diagram is that um, it's used in Islamic art, but it's also used in other faces, right um, from, uh, from ancient Egypt, but it's also used in um, First Nations uh, artwork. So I worked in Canada uh, in, an, in a little uh, reservation off Vancouver Island. Um, and we were le learning just these processes, looking at symbols that related to the seasons. Um, so these are really archetypal universal patterns, and especially this pattern that's used in the Ismaili Center, this eightfold pattern, it has like a, a, a huge history and weight around it. That's really a beautiful and deep interpretation of something that's so simple. That level of complexity behind symbolism is what I find so mesmerizing about Islamic geometry. And I think that's what I find amazing is that my passion for design and my passion for my faith merge together and that's where I get that fulfilling feeling of spirituality when I'm creating this art and that's what truly blows my mind. Now, someone like you, how do you find spirituality through your practice of Islamic geometry and Islamic art? Yeah, for me, um, it's all about process. So I'm fortunate to be working with natural materials. I enjoy looking at the um, to working with wood, which is alive, even after it's been cut down, it has, um, you know, it's come from the earth. I enjoy working with plaster and stone. Um, and I just like the kind of labor intensive element within craft where, you know, you have this repetition of the hammer blow on the chisel, um, which is an opportunity for kind of like zikr or remembrance, sense of humility where you're producing something which is eventually going to be part of a whole. Uh, so there are like naturally just inherent divine principles. So as you're, you know, using this first principle of geometry, you know, you're un unfolding a six-fold pattern. Um, you know, the, these things are really profound and mind expanding. Um, so just the nature of working with natural materials, working with archetypal patterns, you know, has a sort of quality that elevates. And I'm just thank every day that I get to work in, in this field. Whoa, the fact that you find moments of zikr in that repetitive motion of chiseling or even the moments of meditation you find creating art truly blows me away. Now, I guess everyone has a spiritual journey that's very unique and I'm grateful you were comfortable enough to share that with me. Now, are there any specific projects that you've worked on that you've ve felt very spiritually connected to or are very proud of? Uh, I mean, there's so many projects, Raheem. Like, I mean, the, I really enjoyed working with First Nations tribe in a house at, um, in, in, in Tofino in a, in a small island and I was building uh, domes with them and looking at geometry and how it relates you know from like the Islamic world to um, you know to the to, 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 to their traditions um, and to the aboriginals in Australia and how they're all connected. Um, I've had interesting projects working across and in Jamaica. I've taken people to Morocco, Turkey, um, Iran um, and then, you know, I have commissioned work that I do here in London. So I was privileged to work with Prince Charles, who's such a champion for traditional arts. And it was so great to just um, have time to converse with him and find out about his interests in, uh, in sustainability um, and, uh, and, and preserving, you know, traditional English and worldwide uh, building crafts and arts. Um, you know, then I've worked with other institutes that have been... Um, you know, uh, admirers of, so I've worked at the Westminster Abbey uh, Cathedral, I've worked at um, Shakespeare Globe, and all of these places you end up collaborating with really remarkable craftsmen uh, who are super inspiring and you end up with a whole new um, sense of awe and respect for, for, for these institutes. Um, so I'm just really glad to be contributing to, to, to all of that and be making, involved and traveling and meeting new people. I think I share that sentiment with you, Adam. Projects that have a strong sense of community behind them always seem to be the most fulfilling for me personally. Have you felt the same level of connection with any of your students? I mean, there's lots of there's lots of uh, times when you you know when I look at uh, somebody who might have studied with us and then has gone on to 
uh, to create amazing work and it's become you know such a passion for them but it's always often a little bit worrying when someone calls up and said oh, I took your class I'm so inspired and I'm, I quit my job and I'm becoming an artist and uh, I'm like no 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 <laughs> like, don't put that on me <laughs> because it's there's no way to no like roots not like being a medic go jump from these through these hoops and from, from these stages to, to 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 work as a professional artist but Mostly if, if I um, engender some passion for the subject um, and, uh, and fulfill like an inspiration or a need that someone might have um, to set them on their way, then I'm over the moon. So I'm really humbled to be in that position where I can help at times. Well, after your class in New York, I think I was definitely one of those students that wanted to quit my job and go head first into this world of art but you helped me see the reality of how to balance this artistic desire with the reality of, of life. Now, do you have any advice for anyone that's strongly artistically inclined and are not sure how to begin that journey? Yeah, if there's, I mean, the people talk about talent, but I think that the talent, the gift is the passion for the subject. So once you have that, then everything follows because a master is just like a signpost. He's, you know, you don't stand next to a signpost. You follow the direction and there's only so much they can do. And it's really down to this 10,000 hours where you just got to sit there and make and make and make. And eventually, um, yeah, like these shapes start to speak to you, you know, and uh, everyone says that. It's not just me. I'm not crazy. But like, they've, you know, the forms themselves become the educators and through, through time, um, you end up, attaining more and more knowledge, and then you can seek out specialists who will add to that. Um, but it's really just putting in the time, you know, get some pointers, get some, get, get some people to help you get started, uh, and then just sit there with the chisel or brush and a pencil and make and make and make and, and get obsessed. If you don't have that passion, if there's not a fire burning there, then, then you know, it's, it, it's, it's, it's going to be a struggle uphill. You've got to want it. Everything you said totally resonates with me. I used to live in San Francisco for about six years, and I spent nearly three years in the wood shop almost every night burning that midnight oil just to discover my passion and find my own particular style to develop my products. Now, if it wasn't for all that time, I definitely wouldn't have the opportunities I've truly been blessed with. Now, Adam, not to derail our conversation, but I'm looking at you and I see all these gorgeous sculptures behind you. What are they? Can you tell me a little bit about them? Yeah, so these are part of an ongoing series that I've been making for years and years, um, looking at tessellating geometry and uh, individual shapes which can tessellate and um, create these archetypal structures that self-support. Uh, so this one here is, um, is a maquette for a larger sculpture that I made, and it's a series of roulé triangles, um, which all fit together. But most of the patterns that we're working with, whether they're larger um, polyhedra or you know, elements of this six-fold pattern that you see here. Um, they're using inherent, like aspects of inherent um, sacred geometry and often, you know, using Islamic patterns too. So this one is actually made of a series of concentric circles. Um, and then I've just taken elements of it, um, relaxed them and then reassembled them so that they can make this uh, architectural structures. Um, and they've been in a few shows that some of the pieces are exhibited in, in LA and New York and um, Abu Dhabi and I had a big solo show in London too where um, you know I called it the geometric moon jungle because it just had a whole series of these uh, various sculptures using um, uh, trying to stay true to the uh, archetypal values within Islamic geometry but kind of using a more contemporary approach. Amazing so I know I know you're a super talented and humble guy but if you had to pick that one project you're so proud of what would that one project be? Um, I don't know if I have a project that I'm proud of, but I have projects. Um, I mean, I, I'd say if I was going to if I was going to talk about projects I'm proud of, it would be the communal projects. So where I've seen a difference in people's lives, rather than commission projects. So um, you know, working in Azerbaijan and the academy there, or working in the First Nations, or working with the craftsmen in Jamaica, where I actually see them, uh, or the online classes. You know, I see people who I've benefited with the skills that I've acquired. Um, those are the projects that I'm most proud of. 
uh, especially you know like in Jamaica we were when I went there it was really hard for them to accept me um, but then as soon as they saw me working with a chisel you know I kind of overcame that um, I was accepted within the community and then we took the artwork and took it to another level and where they were able to um, make a better living and you know um, better prospects as, as craftsmen and as artists to feed their families you know there was a lot of poverty there so when I see that kind of result um, you know a bit of pride or sense of achievement. Adam, you are truly a very humble artist, and I love the idea of bridging the gap and increasing the welfare of others. It, it seems to be a common theme to our conversation that we're having right now. It seems almost perfect that I'm sitting at this beautiful Toronto Smiley Center and we're having this conversation because it's not just a space for prayer. It's a space for bringing different communities together and fostering a sense of pluralism through cultural diversity. Now, these are smiley centers all around the world in Toronto and Tajikistan and Vancouver and your backyard of London all make such profound statements of social cohesion through their architecture and their design. Now, you've traveled all around the world. Are there any particular influential Islamic buildings that have truly blown you away? Well, there are so many buildings that blow me away. Um, you know, the Atarin in Fez, Morocco, the Alhambra. Um, but really, it must be uh, in Esfahan. I mean, I love the, the Jami Mosque there, but the Lutfala Mosque, which is uh, off the Shah Square, was incredible. And I did a lot of analysis of the dome there, um, which has all this Abjad system behind it, which is a sacred numerology. Um, so the number of Shamsas that are in this dome relate to the womb. This is a, uh, was a building only for females, the, the design work in there is extraordinary. And just the way that as you enter the building, you go down this dark corridor, um, as you're walking down the dark corridor, you suddenly take a, a turn and you come into this majestic room-like um, sacred space where you are held. Um, the pattern work is overwhelming, but also humble. I mean, the, the way that the cobalt and terracotta tiles make the adobe bricks look like golden, majestic, um, glowing kind of pattern work. Uh, it's just really overwhelming and, and, and humble at the same time. And it's your testament to those craftsmen uh, to create something with that, uh, which will have that effect on anyone who walks in there. It's really interesting how all these mosques all around the world have been made so long ago and they speak volume to us today when we visit them all around the world. Now, if we look at the shift of, for example, Fumiko Maki, with his design of the delegation building in Ottawa, the Aga Khan Museum in Toronto, or even right in your backyard of London, the Aga Khan Center that opened up uh, a little while ago, um, how does this emergence of contemporary style make you feel about the future of Islamic geometry? Well, I would say that, um, you know, this all of it is innovation in the sense that, you know, we, we, the, the it's, we started in the desert and then you have these, you know, the Alhambra Palace and what happened in between and you know, um, the aqueduct systems, the, the building techniques, the domes, you know, this is all um, cutting edge technology for its time. So I think tradition is something that's constantly growing. It's not something that um, you, know, you look back on, you look over your shoulders and it's growing and you're, and I would see contemporary architecture as, uh, like the forefront of um, a growing tradition. Would you say that perhaps technology and digital media are currently the forefronts of contemporary architecture? Well, I would say that one thing is certain that there's a huge interest worldwide in Islamic pattern now, and it goes hand in hand with this uh, interest in geometry. You know, we've gone through the sort of postmodern period, and now people are interested in um, reconnecting to. Um, skilled work to draftsmanship to um, a more hands-on approach so something that I've been interested in for a while but I feel like there's a big uh, curve coming and I think that there'll be an interesting combination of doing things by hand and having a hand element with all these incredible technological innovations that we're having I mean I find as long as there's some um, human element to it that I don't have an issue with, with technology it's really interesting to hear the world of Islamic geometry kind of going back in time and taking more of a hands-on style approach, especially in the world where everything is rapidly going towards the digital world. Now, are there any dream projects you're looking forward to working on in this new age approach? 
Oh, well, I mean, a lot of the projects that I've ended up doing have been my dream projects, you know, and, uh, you know, working with, um, uh, working with native people, uh, working with in traditional crafts, you know, working in the jungle in Malaysia with um, Nohaiza Nuriadin was a dream, uh, working in North America. Um, so where's next? Oh, I don't know. I mean, I... Um, I don't know. Like at the moment, I'm in this interesting place where I'm just very receptive to um, to the moment, and uh, I feel like I have all of this experience now, and I have all of these skills. Um, uh, it's all about responding to the moment. So in in the space I'm at now is actually kind of a really unique space. Instead of sort of searching for something, I'm just in the space with these skills kind of responding to the moment. And so I'm very intrigued to see what kind of art is gonna come out of that state. I think that's a really strong message, Adam. Living now and taking life as it comes during these unpredictable times is really important because of how easy it is for us to lose sight on the present and fear for tomorrow. For those that are struggling to live in the now, what would you say are some of the best ways to kind of get into that mindset, at least when it comes to Islamic geometry? Well, if you're interested in the subject, um, then uh, yeah, you can come and take classes with us. Um, if it's something that you want to pursue, then there's lots of opportunities, both with us and other people, to use as a springboard to get your practice under underway. But if you're in any way interested in, in, in pattern and craft, then I'd recommend, yeah, just getting started. It's the hardest thing is getting started. And once you um, make any kind of mess on the page you know and then you can start to tidy it up and i really feel like it's a little bit like a dance that you know in dancing or dancers say this you're constantly sort of falling over and correcting yourself and you can say the same in art you know you make a bit of a mess and then you correct it and tidy it up and you've got to just put throw all the jigsaw pieces on the table and then arrange it um so just get started and the rest will come into will come together by itself well, Adam, you've given me a lot to think about today. Thank you so much for your time. I'm truly grateful for our conversation, and I hope we can connect again soon. Fantastic. Nice to see you, Raheem. Thanks for this. Thank you, Adam, for taking this time. I really appreciate it. Now, I hope all of you learned a lot through Adam's narrative on the world of Islamic geometry and his impact to design a better world for all of us. Thank you. Thank you.